Here we go. Everybody can see my screen, correct? Well, I could. No, we cannot see your screen. Not yet. Now you, you were there and now you're gone. Jordan, I've uh, just passing presenter to you. There you go. I got it. Okay. Again, eventful night. So the purpose of this evening, um, just to get us started, I'm gonna quick start to get my other computer going. Um, is gonna be it's gonna be threefold. The first thing we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be providing our stakeholders, that is our community, our families, um, our staff, um, including our teachers and our and our classified staff, um, as well as our administrators, with information about the current plans being built um, and what's going on. Is um, we are building the 21 and 22 school year. Um, we need your help. We need uh, to be able to make sure that we're getting all the ideas that that you have to offer. Um, the second thing we're here to do is to provide an overview of what is already happening and where there are some ideas to expand you might be able to the, the community is going to be given the opportunity to provide that feedback um, number three is going to be to empower our community to provide us feedback on the direction in which we are headed it's extremely important that we're getting um information from our stakeholders in terms of building ab86 our, our plan for ab86 and our local and control and accountability plan At the end of this uh, meeting tonight you're going to be given the opportunity uh to uh to be able to provide input via a form that we that i will be reviewing with you so that you will have access and be able to make that happen at your leisure. Um, and uh, Mr. Hoffman will be providing you direction on that. So, so to begin with, I wanted to start off with an overview of the planning. Um, again, this is for AB 86 and the local control and accountability plan. Um, I want to make sure that the board and everybody in the community realizes that we started this work last year and we've continued it into this um, as though we weren't able to provide the local control and accountability plan last year. This year, we've been given the opportunity and the go ahead to start the process of building that through the state of California and through our local uh, through our county, our friends at the county office. The vision of Lancaster School District was brought to the board and the board approved it last year when we started talking about our strategic plan and we have planned to bring that particular vision and mission forward so the idea of creating those that options and excellence in education for our students empowering them empowering all of our students to reach their full potential is still our vision in lancaster school district for which every single action which for which every single objective will continue to be uh, to be to be derivative of that's going to be where we're that's going to be where everything's coming from. Our mission is to provide a relevant, high quality education within an inclusive and culturally respectful environments, preparing all students for personal and professional success. Again, still the mission that that is the what of of why we do what we're doing. Um, I did want to make this a realization for everyone here that we have based upon that work and the vision and mission. Um, we've started the process of bringing goals to the to the board and to the community so that we have some ideas as to where to work from. Um, in academics, we've we continue to focus on our academics. I'm not going to read every goal here, but I am going to uh, provide a, a an overview of what we're looking for and looking to try to complete. Um, this one in terms of academics talks about making sure that we have a variety of assessments, which provides for equity within our learning system and provides for different ways of our students to be able to learn. We have equitable learning practices and positive learning environments. Um, the idea of this being that it's our job to eliminate barriers for our students so that our so that our students can be successful. It's almost that pathful leadership or pathful teaching type situation in which we take away the barriers so that our students can be successful. The third goal at this point is saving is to be safe, have provide safe and supportive environments. In this particular way, we know that our students must be safe when they walk in the classroom. And I think that's probably one of the most important goals that we have in any school year, but especially this one moving forward. And I think you're going to see what we've done to be able to make that happen this year. And finally, community, family, community engagement. Um, one of the things we did do with this one is we did uh, make sure that we're in the process of talking about families and community and making sure that we're not just focusing on just parents, but the families as a whole and working with the families as a whole. Um, and build this, the idea here is really about building positive partnerships and partnerships, not just relationships and partnerships with their students learning. The other plan that we're talking about tonight to kind of break it in part is our AB 86. The overview of this plan or this law, this is not the plan yet, but this is the law that we have. This is what we can do with the funding that's going to be that's going to be coming from AB 86. Um, 
so there's two different pieces to this. There's in-person learn. There's an in-person learning grant and an expanded learning opportunities grant. Um, tonight, uh, you're really going to be focusing hard on the expanded learning opportunity grant, and that's going to be where we're really going to be looking for feedback. But we're also going to be asking, is there anything else we can do to make our schools safe, safer than they already are? Uh, we've done a lot of good work, and you're going to hear a lot about what's been happening through uh, Ms. Sampson and her and, and her team. Uh, Mr. Freeze was was instrumental in that work. Um, on the expanded learning side of the game on, of this, um, we really do focus on the idea of how are we going to best address learning um, gaps that may have that may have arisen, or how do we enrich our students, and how do we make the students that we have moving forward? How do we provide that expand those expanded opportunities, those extended opportunities for our students to take the next steps in their education past just a grade level, so that we can start thinking outside the box? The one thing that we are very uh, that we're extremely uh, like cognizant of is the fact that throughout this whole process, our learning system in Lancaster School District will be drastically will be drastically different than what it's been in the past because we are going to a different we're going into a new era of education. So we're looking forward to seeing what that's going to look like. And again, like I said tonight, we need your help with that. So with that said, um, it's important and it's one of it's puts a lot of onus on us in our in, in our team, the team that's here tonight to provide you with some base information to be able to have an understanding of what's going on. Now, there's going to be more information and more um, more data coming later. Um, today is just a very uh, high high level view, but we definitely want you guys to have, we want everybody here to have uh, a solid understanding of where we're at. So with that said, I'm going to ask Mr. Yoon to, um, to unsilence himself so that he can come on in and he is going to provide us some information on our iReady assessment. Thank you, Dr. Goins. About a month ago, uh, Mr. Hoffman had shared with the board the learning loss data. Tonight, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the fall and uh, mid-year I ready, and I cannot wait until we get our end of the year results, and I will definitely share that information in the fall. Um, the goal is that we really want to see this staircase um, effect. We want to reduce the, the two grade levels below or more, and we want to see the increase of the upper band. As you can see, based on the fall to winter, we saw an increase of 3% for students on um, early on grade level, um, all the way up to above grade level. Uh, in terms of number of participants, uh, in order for the student to be uh, included in this comparison, they have to take both the fall and also the winter uh, diagnostic. So again, you can see that our students are making progress. They are moving um, out of the lower bands into the upper band. So it, it's really great to see. Next, please. So this is for reading. So we, we see the same um, results as, as uh, was indicated in mathematics. That's their effect. Again, um, our goal is that we want to reduce the number of students or the percentage of students who fall in the lower band uh, two or more um, grade level below. So again, we saw an increase of the upper band um, from fall to winter. Again, um, 9,093 um, students qualify for this comparison. Again, it has to do with that they have to complete both of the fall and also um, the winter. So again, we we really um, I, I'm really um, excited that I also wanted to recognize our our families, our students, and our um, teachers who had worked extremely hard trying to get our student to um, take the diagnostic in the fall and also in the winter. Um, even with the challenges that we had faced at the beginning of the school year. So again, kudos to the team. So again, I will give you the information and share the information once we have the end of the year um, results in the fall. Thank you, Sam, or Mr. Yoon. Um, so the other piece of data that we think is very integral for us to be able to understand and have an under and have a base understanding of is our youth through student survey data. Um, so the, tonight, what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you a high level understanding of what's what our main themes of the youth through data is. However, we will be diving deeper as as a group um, along with the board into being able to provide uh, a little bit more in terms of our youth truth data in, in terms of numbers and proof positives and positive percentages and where we're at with that. Um, but tonight that's we're just I'm just giving you the uh, an over an overview and summary of this work. So we have taken uh, our YouTube data and identified some some strengths that we saw from both our fam from our families, our staff, both 
both classified and certificated, um, as well as our students, both our elementary and our middle school students. And we saw a lot of great things coming from them. We've seen a lot of good things, and there's a lot of things that they've seen that they've appreciated. And the first one is the idea that they perceive that their teachers have high expectations of them, and that's increasingly throughout this particular time period in our district's history. That's a big deal because our people, because our students know that our kid, that our that our parents or that our teachers have high expectations and that they want them to do the best for themselves. Another huge positive from this particular survey was the fact that both elementary and middle school staff perceived that the relationships were strong among their student with between them and their students, which is a big deal because our because our students saw the same thing. And what that means is that our students have at least one positive relationship with adults on their campus. And that is a is a is a is the uh, is a litmus test for how for, for a student doing well in terms of social emotional learning in those areas. So those are some very strong points, and this is a list of the strong points um, that we have for our students here. We did, however, see some challenges that were existent um, coming from the survey. Um, one of them having to be, and I'll, I'll highlight this one, middle school students perceived belonging and peer collaboration to have declined over this time period. Um, we did under, understandably so in the fact that at that particular age level, we also know that um, students are, are, are very much in need of being able to have that one-to-one -one physical interaction, be able to talk and be able to see people. And that's something that hasn't happened um, consistently over the last, uh, 365 days or since March 13th of last year. Um, another piece here was that school safety scored lowest um, for both elementary and middle school families. However, even with that, it increased over the previous two years. So although that's a considered something that could have been a challenge, it's also a positive in the same way. So with that said, we're gonna jump into why we are and where we are, why we are where we are in the system right now, what we've done, and it's gonna talk a little bit about the hard work that's been that's been going through. Um, so in this particular section, I'm gonna um, ask uh, Ms. Utzler and uh, Ms. Wilson to uh, to unmute themselves so that they can get, so that they can provide you uh, an overall understanding of some of the equitable learning environments that they've been creating and how they've been helping to create those equitable learning environments. So um, Ms. Utzler and Ms. Wilson. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just going to set the stage so that uh, we can take a look at some of the things that have been done, and we really have been uh, working hard to put some um, supports in place for our students. We have had a year like none other. I don't think any of us could have ever dreamed up, you know, what um, has happened, you know, since last March, just a year ago. Um, we have a couple of bits of information there. If you take a look, um, one out of five students with mental health needs, um, that, that was a number pre-pandemic. So we felt as if we didn't quite have enough supports even back then. You know, we were just embarking on a partnership with um, DCFS. We were excited, you know, mental health services were coming into our area. And, um, you know, then we were sent home. Um, so we were uh, in looking at this poll and, and this particular poll was um, a CDC National Institute of Mental Health poll, a Harris poll. Um, we're looking at seven out of 10 students now have some mental health needs due to the pandemic. And that would be to be expected. You know, it's it, like they said, it, it's been a year um, like none other. Um, the number one obstacle to learning is now depression, stress, or anxiety. Um, and that's not all bad. We're gonna get into some a uh, little bit better information in just a minute, but we do have to look at it and recognize the fact that our kids are hurting, our families are hurting, and you know our staff have been through um, something that uh, we never would have anticipated. Um, circumstances of the pandemic have caused trauma to our students and teachers. Um, you know, when we talk about trauma, we're talking about you know sometimes the loss of a loved one, um, possibly you know the idea of being confined at home. You know, at the very least, um, most of us have experienced times of isolation times of uncertainty, not really knowing, um, you know, what's going on or what we're able to be able to do about it. Um, so that fear associated with the unknown, economic stresses, uh, you know, sometimes it being trapped in a dysfunctional environment um, and not really being able to get out of it or not being able to see how you're able to get out of it. Um, so we're looking at a situation where, um, you know, our, our experts agree when students return and we have our students coming back now and our staff, uh, back on campus, we need to provide social emotional learning supports to, to reinforce physical and psychological safety. And if you take a look there, Maslow's hierarchy is there. 
um, mitigating effects of trauma. Uh, we have a couple of things that um, I'll share with you we're doing, and that's going to be the rest of the presentation. But if you take a look at that psychological um, needs section and, and the safety section, it, it's the absolute you know, cornerstone of Maslow's hierarchy. In order to reach any type of, of area where we can truly be educated, um, we have to have those needs met. So we're looking at allowing for student voice, providing a forum for shared experiences, establishing predictable routines, providing reminders of class norms, and encouraging students to identify emotions. Um, and we have a number of things that we've been doing throughout the past year, and then some more things that we're going to be doing in the coming year that our coordinator, Trish Wilson, um, who is coming up next, is going to talk to us about. So Trish, our coordinator for counselors, and um, a couple of other things on next. Thank you, Julie. Um, so dur during distance learning, we've had a lot of things going on to support students' social emotional learning. Our counselors have created weekly lessons and the teachers have provided those to their students. Counselors have also continued to provide um, individual and group counseling along with opportunities for students to socialize with their peers during lunchtime and on Saturdays. In addition, over 25 different workshops have been offered throughout the school year to support our parents and caregivers. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so we have a comprehensive social emotional learning plan that is currently being implemented and will continue into the fall. Um, the August 6th, Dis District-wide Teacher Professional Development Day will include um, training on trauma, the digital version of Second Step, which is our social-emotional learning curriculum, and a training on community circles. Um, and community circles addresses the um, psychological and safety needs that Julie mentioned in that first slide. Um, and it's basically a strategy that can be used throughout the school day to promote a sense of belonging, community and empathy within the classroom. Um, there are many benefits to community circles that will support the needs of our students that have resulted from um, trauma associated with COVID-19. We also have staff and student workshops that are offered by K Kaiser Educational Theater that'll support self-care and healthy coping strategies. Finally, the community agencies that provide school-based mental health on all of our campuses will have additional capacity support to support an increase in possible referrals. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Sampson, the coordinator of climate, school safety, and emergency management. And I believe her title is just slightly longer than mine. So Jenny, it's yours. Thank you, Trish. Um, I wanna get started today by talking about um, safety in terms of the pandemic. We have gone through quite a bit. Next slide, please. We've gone through quite a change in our schools over the past year. Um, even though students were not in the schools, we still had staff working in the schools and we had to work to keep them safe as well. So um, one of the things that we have worked very hard on and Dr. Freeze has been instrumental in this as well as many other departments, but the reopening protocols from the Department of Public Health um, they change frequently, and we've had to keep up with each and every time those protocols have changed. And fortunately, we haven't had a change in the past three or four weeks, knock on wood, but um, that they stay the same for at least a little bit longer. But every time that document changes, the principals have to respond. We have to respond as a district. We have to implement new strategies and new um, whatever they're they're requiring us to do. So um, that's been a constant, never ending um, keep up game. The exposure management plan is also a public health document that we are required to maintain. Um, it explains how we communicate with um, staff or families of students who have been exposed to a pos confirmed po positive case. So we've had a lot of work with public health and out of those two documents and the requirements that public health has um, mandated, we've produced three different documents for our district. The first two documents are 
primarily for um, staff and employees of the district. However, they are available on the district website for anybody to view. The COVID prevention plan talks about strategies that we use to identify and control COVID hazards um, at the schools and at the departments. It also talks about um, the training and that regarding the new processes and procedures that we've put in place so that staff um, always know what to do when something happens. The next document, the COVID response plan, um, talks about how the school responds when a confirmed positive case is brought to our attention. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a staff member or a student who is ill, who has been on campus, the response is the same. We have to inform the people who may have been exposed that they, they need to quarantine, that they may need to seek testing. We conduct contact tracing and it, that, that plan also outlines um, the contact tracing procedures as well as the different forms of communication about how we um, communicate that information. Um, Dr. Freeze, each and every time we have to update our protocols because of public health um, changes, he has to update those, those plans every time. Um, if we change a procedure internally because we have tweaked it, he has to update that every time. And that gets sent out to every employee in the district so that they're aware of any changes that, that come across. Those two documents can always be found on the district website. So I encourage you to go take a look at those. The third document is our safe school reopening plan, and that's geared primarily toward families. It discusses um, the the expectations we have as a school district for when children arrive on our campuses. It outlines some of the procedures that we are we have um, altered because of our response to COVID. Um, it talks about things that we do as a district to keep the students safe from um, exposure to a potential case. But it also outlines the instructional program options that families can choose from um, depending on what their needs are at the time. And as you can see, we've had a, an enormous amount of supplies and materials that we've had to um, install in classrooms and offices and just things to keep everybody safe. And I wanna take a minute just to commend our maintenance and operations teams. Um, they have worked tirelessly to get our classrooms ready for students to come back. They worked throughout the pandemic to keep our schools clean and sanitized and mm -hmm. disinfected. And um, they've done an outstanding job. They've worked the entire time through the pandemic. And I, I'm very grateful that they have um, taken this very important, um, this important step to keep us all safe so that we can return to school with students. So. Um, some things that are in development right now, we are in the process of implementing Catapult EMS, which is our emergency management system. Um, we have these several training videos for staff. Um, we're currently working on implementing drills now that students are back on campus. Um, we've developed a comprehensive uh, safety resource, kind of like a library that has all the training that We've been offering throughout the year that's listed and hyperlinked and they can just click and go and watch a short little 60 second video on how to account for yourself in, in catapult or um, what to do if you might have an ill student in the classroom. So there are resources that have been put together. Um, plans for next year include videos for families and students. Um, Student safety is important and they need to know how to keep themselves safe. So um, that's on the forefront of next year's plan. With that, I think I'll turn it back over to Dr. Goins. Thank you very much, Ms. Samson. So, um, so now we go on to the section of uh, this plan, this or what we're looking to try to do in terms of student learning, which is really talking about our academics in terms of the LCAP. So with that said, I'm gonna um, have Ms. Thompson, um, Mr. Hume, Mr. Cohn, and Ms. Dana, and uh, Ms. Fountain all unmute so that you guys, so that we can take it on from here. And I think we start off with, uh, we start off with Ms. Thompson. 
Good evening. So uh, as you know, we have learned a lot about teaching and learning during this pandemic. So uh, I want to visit with you a little bit about what we've um, done to address learning loss, also referred to as unfinished learning and learning recovery. Uh, first and foremost, coming into the um, 2021 school year, we knew that we needed to focus on high priority standards. There are a lot of standards that students have to learn each year um, in all of their subjects, especially language arts and math. So we needed to help teachers and students narrow that focus down because time was short um, and we needed to get to the essential skills. So um, our coaches developed some high priority standards documents for teachers um, and some I can statement documents for parents so that there was a clear focus on what the essential skills and, and con uh, concepts were um, to learn during the school year. Um, we started with um we, we focused on starting with grade level standard and then scaffolding to where the students were because we know students coming into this year um, missed some, some learning there at the end of last year. Um, so we know we wanted to kind of meet them where they were and pull them up to grade level standards. And so there was a big focus on learning prerequisite skills and planning around prerequisite skills so that we could build the student skills up to grade level standards. Um, and so there was a lot of resources prepared for teachers, for staff and parents, and a whole lot of training this year for um, a lot of staff members and teachers um, and coaching support was really important this year to support everyone up. Uh, in the use of technology, I'm not going to step on Sam's toes. He goes after me and he's got a huge piece here, but this, I think technology wins the day um, this year. So it was really exciting to see um, our students, our teachers and our families step up to the plate and take on the challenge of learning new technology. Um, and so I'm going to let Sam elaborate on that, but that was a huge piece of learning this year. Uh, we we continue to um, focus on collaboration and assessment data to make st um, decisions for student um, student groupings and intervention and meeting their needs. And um, we also learned about the impact of asynchronous learning, um, independent learning, learning differently for students. Um, it, it kind of shone a spotlight on some things that students were very successful with and not so successful this year. Um, we know that um, many students struggle to complete work. They struggle um, have struggled to complete work independently at home um, outside of you know, the, the area of the teacher. Um, a lot of students would engage synchronously with the teacher, but then once they're done with that synchronous time, they're done with school. And so it's hard to get um, some students involved in that work that happens asynchronously or, or homework or independent learning time. But we also found the flip side of that, that there are students who actually were more successful and thrived more in the distance learning format. So how do we carry that forward um, and, and um, meet those strengths, use those strengths moving forward? Another huge focus for us this year and moving forward will be um, foundational math and reading skills. As we know, um, the foundational reading skills and literacy are extremely important um, in setting up the route, right foundation for learning um, throughout the grades. So um, this year we did a focus on digital and physical manipulatives in math. Um, we had some great training with Dr. Douglas and our math coach, April Greidler, um, in using some manipulatives and, and engaging in math learning online and virtually. So very um, huge success with that. Um, and we also focused on using appropriate assessments frequently and effectively, and that will carry forward as well. Um, and finally, in terms of what we've really learned this year um, with um, professional development is that we had to develop, deliver and participate in training this year completely virtually, which opened up a whole new world for, for a lot of people. Um, we found that we had a whole lot more participation in a lot of our PD courses this year. Um, it's super convenient for people to just click a button and hop in the meeting as, than it is to drive across town. Um, there's also different ways of engaging when you're virtual as opposed to in person. Um, and the async, we explored the asynchronous side of PD where teachers could really, um, teachers and all staff can really um, do learning on their own, choose their own courses, or, or participate in PD that they like on their own time. And so there was a lot of success with that, and we're going to carry that forward to next year as well. So moving into next year, um, as we go learning forward, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, learning forward and moving into next year, we know that, um, and the whole reason that we're here is there are some needs we need to address through our LCAP and the AB86 funds. Um, again, we have we know we've had students who have struggled all, all year to engage um, synchronously and asynchronously, um, and and have really struggled. We know that we um, have continue to have students in every grade level who are three or more grade levels behind, um, whether it's distance learning or not, that just, we, we have students every year um, in that category. So we need to, what are we gonna do to support those students? So our, again, our very first 
priority is going to be to focus on our high priority standards. We're going to continue with that narrow focus um, and the prerequisite skill building to make sure that our kids are getting the essentials of what they need in each grade level. Um, and we're also going to continue that strong focus on foundational reading and math, um, math standards and skills. Um, this spring, we've had um, three of our instructional coaches, a district coach and two site coaches that have worked extremely hard to build a reading foundation scope and sequence for our wonders curriculum for K through second grade. Um, and so we are really excited to roll this out um, to our teachers as a, a roadmap, basically, for how to navigate their curriculum and teach the reading foundational skills. It's been something that's been much needed for a long time, so we're really excited to, to roll that out for next year. Um, we're also um, at the district level going to be tweaking the focus of one of our district instructional coaches to focus on foundational reading support. So very excited about that. Um, when we look to intervention structures and practices, we know that um, there's a lot of ways that we can use our time more effectively to provide intervention. Um, and with the funding, I think that that's going to allow us to really explore some things outside of the box um, to provide that in a more effective way. So we're going to be looking at different ways that we can use our time for intervention inside and outside of the school day to provide supports for students. Uh, we're going to look at the use of different personnel and how to how to use different people in different capacities to provide even more support and in different ways and more effectively for students. We will continue to focus on PLC collaboration and support. That's always essential moving forward, um, looking at data, making decisions, putting kids in flexible groups, um, focusing on small group um, work and instruction. Another piece that's really become um, something that we want to explore and investigate it and look at different ways of approaching um, is the role of independent learning at home, student learning at home. And so, first of all, we want to explore homework and what that looks like at home. Um, what is the purpose of homework? Is it serving its purpose? Is it effective? Um, what, what can we do with homework to make it even more successful um, and support it more effectively for our students? We also brought in some pretty robust tutoring programs this year, and so um, we want to follow through with that. And so tutoring shouldn't be an independent activity for students that um, is solely the responsibility of the student. We want to make sure that if a student is um, participating in tutoring, that there's follow up and follow through at the school site. So we want to provide some support through some different adults and different personnel um, to help mentor students and focus on how they can use that tutoring to really connect their learning to what they're doing in, in the, during the school day. Um, and also we want to create some robust home learning opportunities, really explore how we can make learning at home more comprehensive and more engaging, providing different materials and different learning experiences to really um, engage students from home in, that, in those home learning opportunities. So lots to explore there. And finally, um, we will be, we have purchased and we'll be exploring and building a new professional learning management system um, to really meet the 21st century um, position that we're in, in terms of PD. We've learned a lot this year about PD and training and, and adult learning. And so we wanna um, capitalize on that and look at some new and different ways that we can provide training and professional growth for all of the adults in our system, um, classified teachers, administrators, um, all across the board. So we're very excited to um, explore all of these options. And at this point, I'm now gonna turn it over to my fabulous partner in crime, Sam. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Um, this year has been the learning curve was steep in regards to technology. Um, it takes a lot to learn uh, new technology for staff, uh, students and family. Our teachers learn how to use the remote learning tools, set up account, um, created and taught routine for their students and built engaging lesson plan around the use of these tools. Um, they have adapted their instruction to support students, even they um, are not in the physical classroom. Now that um, our students are starting to come back into the classroom, all of these tools allow our students to be creative, um, actively uh, participate in the learning, and ultimately, and this is really important for us, give them a greater ownership of their learning. So moving forward, we need to leverage these online tools to maximize student engagement and instructional time in the classroom. Um, on the slide, here are just some examples of how of these tools have been used in the classroom to engage our students. So the first one is the flip um, classroom. What it means is that the students are exposed to new concepts 
outside of the classroom before they receive direct instruction. So an example, a teacher could potentially put in a short video um, on a specific topic um, in their Google Classroom, student access that um, resource and kind of preview the material before they enter the classroom the next day. So that, that pre-knowledge is there. Um, gamified learning, um, basically what it means is transforming the classroom environments and regular activity into a game. Uh, Nearpod is one of the program that platform that we are currently use as a district. Um, it allow our teachers to take any lesson and turn it into a very interactive, whether it's in person or virtually. Um, in Nearpod alone, there's a, a program or, or um, what we call a, a formative assessment time to uh, climb, allow the student compete with each other at the same time, assess the student where they're at, matching pairs, that's another one. So again, there's different tools to really engage our students, no longer just you know textbooks or paper and pencil. Um, digital field trip, as you know, many of our students don't have access to go on field trip or, you know, they want to know what, what does that look like on the moon? You know, we have the ability through technology um, using the virtual reality goggles that we've been providing um, to our students uh, through our department. They're able to experience that through technology. So we want to continue to do that and again, um, allow our students to experience some of those, um, you know, um, field trips. Uh, integrate uh, social media. As you know, our students, all of us are very um, proficient navigating different social media. Why not? Why not use that to engage our, our students? Uh, incorporate student input, providing technology really provide our student voice and choices. It's no longer, okay, this is only one way of doing that. There's different ways to demonstrate their learning and also gathering feedback. So an example would be Padlet, um, where a, a teacher can post a question, the student can respond, they can read um, other students' information and gather information. Jamboard is another program that's part of our Google products. Poll is another one that is part of our WebEx and Zoom. So again, a lot of resources, and we have seen some amazing um, things that happen that our teachers and our students are using this tool to really engage in the lesson. Um, creating digital content, you know, uh, um, digital portfolio. We have seen students uh, using Flipgrid where they um, record themselves um, doing and demonstrating their learning. So again, uh, it's no longer just paper and pencil. There's different ways um, that our student can demonstrate, especially with our reluctant learner who doesn't really want to share. And I'm one of those students. But if you give me something, you know, that I can record myself and share my learning, why not? It's a great tool for us to allow our students um, different ways to demonstrate um, what's going on. Have students collaborate and get really interactive. Um, part of it is like collaboration uh, board. That's part of our uh, Neopod. Um, digital whiteboards that the, the students can use. It's part of our WebEx or Zoom meeting. Um, again, breakout session where the students are able to uh, interact and collaborate with their peers using um, breakout and the teachers can jump from, uh, from breakout room to breakout room. Again, giving our students the ability to demonstrate their learning through different platforms, different tools. Uh, incorporate videos and multimedia into lesson and presentation. So, for example, you know, if the teachers want to talk about MAR, they can find a video and embed it in their lesson, right? They can um, show videos, and, and those are all the things that um, allow a student to visually see what it is to experience that through technology. And the last piece is what's really important is that, you know, if the students happen to finish with their activity or whatever it is um, early, we have iReady where the students can get on and get a targeted instruction based on their diagnostic. So that allow us to close that gap. And then I think that's one of the reason why, you know, kudos to our teachers and our students that we look at um, the, the online um, component, the time on task, making sure that our students are meeting the minutes and also that they're passing the lesson and not just going through the lesson, but passing at a rate of 70% or higher. And that's why you saw that increase both in reading and mathematics for the upper band for the 3%. So again, Again, there are different tools that allow our students to really engage. And so for us moving forward, we have to continue to utilize the tool to maximize our engagement of our students, whether uh, you know hybrid, whether they're continuing with virtual or in person. So I'm really excited how 
um, our teachers and our student embrace the technology. But uh, like I said, the learning curve was really steep for all of us. And I appreciate of all the hard work from different departments, um, making sure that our family, our students, and our staff have the tool necessary to be successful, um, whether it's remotely or in person. Um, I'm going to turn um, uh, the, 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 the mic to uh, Mrs. Um, Chacon. Um, thank you, Mr. Yum. Good evening. Uh, well, when it comes to um, English learners, we have a dual obligation um, to ensure that they acquire full proficiency in English as rapidly and effectively as possible, while also ensuring that we address any language barriers that may inhibit them from participating meaningfully in instructional programs and achieving the same rigorous grade level academic standards that are expected of all students. Currently, we have effective systems in place to identify English learners, monitor and evaluate the progress and determine when they no longer need language assistance. We also provide a basic English language development program. However, needs assessment data and federal monitoring have identified a few inconsistencies in implementation across the district. As such, our program priority is to continue to work tirelessly to design a more comprehensive ELD program that will be standards-based and driven by multiple sources of data throughout the district. The EL design team has been meeting regularly to plan a multi-tiered system of support that will address the English learner student individual strengths and needs by providing more training for our bilingual parent educators on foundational literacy skills, a new specialized program for our newcomers that will address both culture and social emotional learning, a writing program for our long-term English learners, and the implementation of new targeted digital tools to maximize teaching and learning in all four domains of language. Thank you. And I think it's now Ms. Jane's turn. Thank you. So I'm really excited because I um, get to actually touch upon a lot of the things that everyone's already discussed because all of the programs that you see on this page involve components that everybody's talked about. We have been able to continue the work to get students engaged in their own learning. I'm going to start with the first picture, which is our ACES grant. We continued our ACES after school work virtually. Now, what that means is we had to restructure an in person program into a virtual platform. We have CKH that's part of it. We have PBIS. We practice a growth mindset. All of our leaders create social contracts for students virtually. Um, we use Google Classroom. We have integrated lessons. We have ICANN statements. We have kid-friendly standards and the students post their work. So we have evidence of learning. Everything we do has a social emotional learning component. Our English learners are learning vocabulary. They're listening, they're speaking, they're engaging. Everything is intentional. We offer such a wide variety of um, options to students that students can select and try things they've never done before. Everything we do is to give students the opportunity to explore, to find out what their talent is, maybe to find out something they never thought they could do, which it's pretty amazing when you see the student feedback because everything we do, we provide surveys to the students, to the parents, we give the students an opportunity to have a student voice to share what it is that they want to see in programming, to give input on how they thought the experience was. What could we do better? And I can tell you that the survey results are 90% or more student satisfaction. And some of them do give us input and they say, can we have longer amount of time in the club? So um, that ACES grant uh, also gives us an opportunity to do some student work, a fun activity, a physical activity, and again, 
growing their talent and ability to believe in themselves. The next uh, picture you'll see is the book club fun. So that's something that we use with our 21st century grant, which is a non school day grant. And it was actually married with um, a grant from Mr. Hoffman, a block grant. We actually did a joint venture and that was to do a book club, a non school day book club. And that is from our flyer that we did over the uh, spring break. Now, with this grant, we are able to offer non school day programs in the same manner that we do with the ACES. I'm not going to repeat everything I said, because it, the same applies. All of our work is grounded in the same principles. We make sure that we are doing what the school is doing. It's an extension of the school day. It's intentional. It's integrated. And our students know when they see a hand signal from capturing kids hearts. They see it at school. Um, enrichment, our learn for life partnership. That partnership, I just shared what our program was for our hybrid. We're going to be using what we have done successfully in person, what we've done successfully online, and we're fusing it to give families options. Options and how their child can best participate in a program that's going to offer the same quality that we have provided, if not better because we're looking to do some more dynamic work. Just like Sam said, we're gonna be looking, we, we incorporate games even in our other programs, uh, the Kahoot, the Nearpod, and we get students excited. They don't even know that they are learning, which is incredible. And we also give them the platform to practice using Flipgrid. They're listening, they're speaking, they're presenting, and they're getting better at it each time. Our next slide at the bottom, we you see virtual social groups. Trish Wilson talked about it. We have counselors that through our EHCY grant, they are hosting Saturday. Did we lose everybody? We lost everybody. I'm the host again. Yes, that means we lost everybody. I'll wait. I'll wait. I won't look quite so terrified this time because I have a feeling <laughs> you're back. I was just on a roll. You were. We're all listening, Jane. Don't come Just back. Keep talking. <laughs> keep talking, Jane. <laughs> Dear. Maybe they're not coming back as fast. Somebody needs to sing. Come on, Kelly. You're up. I think we still have our attendees, even though we don't have the district office. No, there's, I don't, are they? Oh, are the attendees here? Yes, yeah, I think community is still with us, but district office is not. So our board members are not with us. Well, hello, community. No singing, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> good, good call, Kelly. I'll start singing, Kelly. You start dancing. Okay. Just so you're aware, it's still recording. Thank you, Ms. Sampson. Well, I wish there was a way. Does anybody, I, I, I don't, but we'll just. I wonder why is it because they're all on the same network at the district office? It could be the wind. It's pretty bad. The wind does tend to affect the Wi-Fi at the district office. I'm wondering if we maybe should continue with the presentation because it is being recorded. And hold on, let me just see. I'm gonna go into text 
Let's just click CNC. I think we're all texting people right now. Krista, as host, would you be able to share the presentation? Mr. Hoffman said, keep going. And also, um, I text Lorraine to see if because she's in this meeting, if she's actually still in the meeting. Okay, yes, they said continue. Um, Krista, you can share because you have the host abilities. Okay. Um, two do seconds. You, do you want me to pull it up or you can? No, it? I've got it. I just got to get there. Hang on two seconds. So the community is still there. So yes, good. let's okay. keep going. Thank you, community. And uh, I'm going to mute myself. Okay, excellent. So as I was saying, um, with the virtual social groups, just like Trish Wilson was saying, um, that we are able to offer students uh, the ability to interact with each other, to socialize, to learn about themselves, and also to focus on a topic each month. So that truly is an exciting experience uh, for the students and the counselors that have been consistently participating. Um, we also, um, early on, were offering parent workshops on Saturday. Uh, the students loved it so much. Again, we did survey them and they asked for an increased amount of time. So we restructured it to really meet the, um, the call of the students, what they wanted, we gave it to them and they were very happy. And the final picture um, is of a boy who actually participated um, in one of our uh, programs that was made available through the EHCY grant. It is a second grade literacy skill building program. Um, we used baseline data from the BSTP and it was incredible to watch a group of students move along as they learned reading foundational skills. And I'm happy to say that we have had success that we have now seen readers, and we do believe that readers are leaders. So uh, that is one of our students who is holding uh, a great job certificate, uh, recognizing effort and accomplishment, and also work tools. Um, the students are able to get work tools that they can use at home to practice their skills. Um, and that is, what I have to offer for academics and extended learning. And now I'm gonna hand it off to one of the people where it all begins, where we know the learning starts, and that is Kelly Fountain. Let me unmute myself. Thank you, Ms. Dana. So I'm excited to bring up the academics with the foundational skills that we teach in preschool. So I know you've all heard everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten and we say, no, not so much. It, you learned it first in preschool. So in preschool, we cultivate foundational skills for the district's littlest learners. Next slide, please. And I want to just give you a little bit of brief information about preschool. We're a half day preschool program run by the California state preschool contract directly with the Department of Education. All of our teachers are permitted with the Commission for Teacher Credentialing, and we run half day preschools at 11 elementary school sites. We have special education and general education classes for our little learners. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, I have no intention of reading all of this to you. I just wanted to make sure people are aware of all of the foundational things that we are teaching our preschool children. We work with eight different domains of learning. Language and literacy development is the first one, and then English language development for 
for our children. We do have second language learners in our program, but in preschool, we're all learning language for the first time, the written language for the first time. So we do focus on ELD language strategies for all of our children, which Ms. Chacon pointed out is beneficial to all learners. So one of the, one of the things that we focus on the most is um, concepts about print. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that um, in a little in a little bit, and then phonological awareness because we have to set the foundation for what sounds sound like, and then how do you manipulate them when you make words? Okay, next slide, please. Mathematics is one of our other huge domains that we work on with children. So while most people think all we do in preschool is play, we really are setting foundational uh, skills for number sense and algebra and geometry and mathematical reasoning. I happened to catch this picture of this little dude um, putting together these towers with some geometric shapes. So it was perfect for this slide. Next slide, please. These are the other uh, remaining domains. So we have visual performing arts, physical development, health, history and social sciences and, and science in general. We teach scientific in, inquiry as an art form in preschool. And we incorporate all of the different areas of science, life science, physical science. We teach kids what things change, what things, what does it look like to change physically over time when you melt ice, what is that? So we are teaching those foundational skills that every other grade level will build upon. Okay, next slide, please. So, one of the things that we noticed when we did our assessment this year, the DRDP, which is the desired results developmental um, profile, is that kids are missing some gaps here, which you, we've, no, we've noticed in all of the grade levels in the district. One of the things that we are worried about is the foundational skills in um, concepts about print and the foundational skills in phonological awareness, in addition, some social emotional domains. So, on the very first day of school, which the first day of preschool can look a lot like herding cats. On the very first day of school, we knew kids were coming in with some gaps. So we tried to set up some activities and, and prepare ourselves in a way to fill those gaps for the children returning in care. But we still have a large amount of children still at home doing virtual learning. And the very first day, while we did our very um, strategic health checks, the children did not have eyes locked on their parents. They had eyes locked on the door of the classroom. And it was hard to get them to not just take off running to meet their teacher in person for the first time. So while we didn't have any meowing or crying, we definitely had kids that were excited to come back. But we do know that they are missing some skills. So we are planning and, and putting together a virtual and an in-person program for the summer, which we will be calling Foundational Extravaganza. The title is missing, I don't know why, but foundational inside will focus on social emotional interests um, and development. We'll talk about Footsteps to Brilliance, which is a program that we've been using with preschool throughout, throughout the school year, and then a circle time that's engaging but socially distanced. Outside will be called Outside Extravaganza, where we will focus on gross motor play because we know that is an area also that is lacking as children have been in, home, in their homes. And we will have make and take kits that focus on those domains, the literacy domains, the math domains, the science domains, and a lot of summer fun. So here's, this is a sample schedule of what we'll be offering. We don't have anything set in stone yet, but we're looking at a three day, a three hour program, five days a week in the morning only, because it does get hot here in the Antelope Valley. So we are looking very much forward to having those kids back with us and getting ready, uh, getting some of them ready for what they need to know in kindergarten after we already teach them what they need to know in preschool. Okay, that I think is, the last slide. Okay, so this is our logo here in preschool intentional interactions, meaningful connections, purposeful play, ECE, the Lancaster way. So while it does look like we are playing, that is what we are doing, but we're doing it intentionally. We are doing it with meaningful connections and we're doing it purposefully. And we are preparing all of the little learners for a successful kindergarten through eighth grade career here in the LA, in the Lancaster School District. That's it for me. So take it away. Who's next? Ms. Shakona and Ms. Casey, which may or may not be with us. So I am here. I believe. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I believe Nayeli Shakona. She's at the the district office too, so she's um, with the others. So we are um, taking a look at our family engagement piece. And if you want to go to the slide above, engaging our Spanish speaking families, I'll touch on that a bit. So Nayeli Chacon, she's our EL coordinator. And so we know with engaging our Spanish speaking families, there are things that we do out of legal ob obligations, but there is also things that we do because we care. So 
our legal obligations are, you know, the annual notifications, the monthly DLAC meetings. Uh, but the things that we do because we care are our Kabe parent conferences. It's a conference that our parents are able to attend along with other um, district staff. Um, the EL website and then also the Facebook page that has a lot of information for our families and keeps them engaged and in the know of what's going on. And then also coming soon will be the monthly EL newsletters for our families and then also what is called um, weekly cafecitos and that will be hosted by our site and will um, include our EO coordinator. Next slide, please. So our family ambassadors, they're an awesome team who pour their hearts and souls into supporting our site and the district community. They've been doing this since the spring of 2019. And so under the three main goals, which is attendance, building a bridge between home and school community, and also being a communicator, our ambassadors take part in any and all work that focuses on the family. On this slide, you'll see only a few examples of what they actually do. So their work has just begun and excitement is stirring as we start focusing on our family outreach. Research shows that when families and community members are involved in student learning, students improve their success helping them feel more confident at school and in taking on more rigorous classwork. And that is what we want, that is our goal. So thank you very much. And I will turn it over to whoever speaks up. I hit stop sharing and I meant to unmute. So I'm super skilled, hang on just a minute, I'm gonna share again. Is there anybody that's on the call that um, knows better this next piece, Sam? Are you are you able to speak to the uh, the form? And I can, but you might have more information than I do. If if needed, I could share it with you because I helped him today, but I can't speak to this QR code because I'm not sure what the process was. I am not sure either um, in regard to that. So maybe um, Kelly, if you can share a little bit about the process, it sounds like you have done some work with Mr. Hoffman. The, I know all I can share with all of you lovely people that are still hanging in there with us is that we have a Google form that we are gonna put out for you to answer some questions about this presentation tonight. It's important that we gather data from you, the stakeholders, about how we're doing as a district and how uh, we are going to, how you can help us support the plan to spend the funding. And we have a, I can share that with you. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what the process was for sharing that, but I can I give you access to it. I believe, Kelly, what was going to happen is that it was going to be pushed out and that there is going to be a QR code. And it's going to be, there's going to be um, information as to how long the survey will be available for input. So yes. I think that's the biggest thing is that we're listening. Let's talk. Um, and there's going to be uh, the opportunity for all stakeholders to give their um, comments. Yes. And I believe this is recorded so that people can refer yes. back to it before they answer that survey. If so, they choose to, yes. I, I believe it'll also be on the website as well. So it'll be pushed out and available on the Lancaster School District website. That That's correct. Under the banner, um, when you see the community forums, um, there is a link to the QR code on there. So if you click on that, if you go to our district website, um, it will give you that information, the flyer in both in English and in Spanish. And the survey as well. Correct. Okay, so that means we're at the launch. Well, nothing like launching without the board and our district office people. So uh, thanks everybody that stuck it out and stuck with us through the technical difficulties. Again, this is recorded and will be made available to everybody to see in all its glory um, on the website. Um, please take part in the in the survey um, and give us your feedback and input. And thank you for staying with us. I think we're going to go ahead and call it a night.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.